All right. Thanks for joining us, everybody. As you can see right away, we have special guest, um, WaveLab user, UK-based mastering engineer, um, Katie Tovini, joining us today from, obviously, the UK. Hi, Katie. Hi, Justin. Thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks for joining us. Um, we're going to talk about a number of things today, including, you know, mastering, audio, Wave Lab, and then as a kind of a special end of the year thing, we're going to just kind of go into a general mastering Q and A. If anybody happens to have any, you know, general mastering questions, we usually, I usually stick to Wave Lab specifically in this in these videos. I don't even really get into mastering techniques because it's uh, a can of worms. But today we'll talk a little bit about mastering. If anyone wants to ask questions, so feel free to do that in the YouTube chat box. I'm gonna monitor those and ask Katie. We'll do that to kind of close things out. So thanks again for watching. Um, Katie's credits, um, a lot of great credits here, include the band Ash, um, Emily Sande, Arlo Parks, the Royal Philharmonic Orchestra, um, Arcs, which Katie has told me is one of her favorite albums she's ever worked on, which um, she could tell us more a little bit about that. Sega Bodega, we are scientists, Loeb's Moonchild Sanily, if I got that right, Hundred Reasons, Sunset, and Nadine Sa. Nadine Shah. So those are just a little bit of her credits. You can go to Weird Jungle. Is it weirdjungle.com? Yeah. We'll talk a little bit about Weird Jungle. It's basically a mastering collective that she has formed with a few other people and she can tell us more about that. But if weirdjungle.com has a bunch more information, things to listen to, things to look at and ways to get in touch. So we have someone from Texas already, Michael. Um, and yeah, let's get into it. So I believe the world cup game is over. So hopefully people are starting to tune in or it should be getting close. Um, do you want to tell us a little bit about weird jungle and, and how and why you formed that and, and what it's like to work with a group of people rather than kind of solo? Sure. So, um, like in the pandemic, um, so I quit my job in the pandemic to do mastering full time. I was um, working as a, a transfer engineer until kind of August 2020. But I'd met this guy called Stephen Kerrison, who is a fantastic mastering engineer. Um, during the pandemic and we found out that we got along really well but also had a really similar ethos when it came to working on music. Um, we both are really passionate about putting the artist first and you know we're both sort of music nerds. <laughs> um, <laughs> like really big music nerds. And so we got along really well and he was like you know if, uh, if you've got any like formats or anything you need help with, let me know. So I was like, okay, cool. So we kept on talking and um, I was like, oh, I've got this project that I can't do. Um, do you mind if I recommend you for it? And he was like, sure, that would be great. So I put him forward for it and the artist came back to me and said, oh, thank you so much for recommending Stephen. He was just a dream to work with. And so I was like, okay. This is cool. Um, so we did that a bunch of times and then kind of decided to make it official um, as a collective. I uh, met another mastering engineer over the pandemic called Izzy McPhee, who um, I mentored as part of the Saffron Records um, program. And again, just really, really clicked with her, vibed with her personality and her ethos towards music and was like, okay, let's do this. So it went from being really lonely, working by myself and, you know, just kind of wanting colleagues to all of a sudden having a little team. And it's been really, really nice to work with other people, but also to have people to learn from and ask questions from all the time is amazing. Um, we're constantly learning from each other and it's just, it's made everything loads nicer and it's like a little support network. So for example, um, Izzy's quite a new mastering engineer. So I quality check the work that she's doing when she wants me to, just to make sure that she's, you know, constantly learning and on the right path. 
Um, and if I go on holiday or the stuff that I can't do, projects that I'm working on, the um, has finished, you know, some projects off for me and Van's been really, really happy, you know, or for example, last year I got COVID <laughs> annoyingly and Steve was able to swoop in and get everyone's projects sorted for their deadlines and they all loved working with him. And yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's really great. Uh, yeah, that is interesting. I found, you know, I think people are tired of talking about the pandemic, but in a lot of ways, it was a good reset to kind of stop and think about what's what's important, what could be better, what what could be different, you know, what could we change to just in general, not just in audio, but in our entire lives. You know, I've had to refer a few projects to people um, in the last year or two because I've been out of town, but I, I at times I wish I had a more official collective setup like you guys have done. So I think that's I think it's a very good idea and I'm a little bit old enough to remember when studios had a bit of a staff back when I was recording and mixing more you know when there would be a handful of people in the building that you could talk to and bounce ideas off of and learn from so I think the fact that you guys have found a way to do that in the digital age um, is, is very cool and helpful and uh, I could see more people doing that now that they've you've given them the idea so and if anybody wants to type in, if our levels are okay, that would be appreciated. I've tried to balance out our voices as best as I could, but feel free to comment on the quality. Um, and I was going to ask, um, not to get too much into WaveLab right away, but has it been helpful? Does everyone use WaveLab um, that works in the weird jungle? Does it help? And if, if so, does it help to pass projects between each other if someone has to finish something? Yeah, I mean... Um... Steve, Steve and Izzy are both on WaveLab 11. I'm on a little bit of an old version, um, just because I'm a creature of habit. Um, but it is really helpful um, because we can send, you know, session files to each other or whatever, um, right. or um, plug in presets. You know, if I've made like a really great starting point that I'm like, oh, this is cool. This everyone's scared of this plugin. <laughs> let's share this and then you know it's just the starting point to to learn from right yeah I, I also have a bunch of templates you know that if i were to have an assistant or something you know i'd say please use this template because everything's loaded up how i would like so i was just kind of curious about that um and the, I, I know i started a little bit in the in the now times but can you tell us a little bit about how you got into mastering you know some people started out as recording and mixing engineers some people some people were fortunate to you know intern with an existing mastering engineer and they skipped kind of the whole recording and mixing thing. So I'm kind of curious about how you got in, into mastering. So I did the recording and mixing thing. Really loved recording so much. Um, yeah, like sad that I could never make that work as a job. Um, it just didn't happen. But because like when you do recording, people expect you to mix, or at least when you're starting out, they do. I am terrible at mixing, like just the worst. And I would practice and practice and never get better. And it got, I got really sad about it and went on some online forums and asked how you get better at mixing. And this was before YouTube tutorials and all of, you know, that kind of, nice resources so i was learning from books and listening and talking to people um right. and it, you know it just wasn't clicking and anyway i asked in the forum how you get better at mixing and someone said learn how to master because you'll be really focused on the end product and i don't know if that was good advice or not but anyway i took it because i was like really desperate to learn how to mix and <laughs> So I used to like take tracks home um, that from the studio I worked at and practice mastering them <laughs> on a, a really like basic setup. You know those compute those like speakers that used to get free with a PC. Yeah. In, in the early two thousands, <laughs> on some of those. Um, that's why I use the term mastering very loosely. Um, and then when the professional masters came back, I used to take them home and kind of listen to them and work out why mine sounded really different and sort of see what the proper 
engineers had done and think about why they'd done it, all that kind of stuff. So I didn't really know what mastering was, but I was, you know, really trying to figure it out. Um, and then fast forward a few years, someone asked me to master something and I said, no. And then he asked me again and I said, fine, but don't use it if it's shit. <laughs> and uh, we bet like, yeah, we spent all night working on this EP, just bouncing versions back and forth over the internet. And eventually in the morning we had kind of a, you know, we had a thing and he took it to the band, the band liked it. And then I got booked for another job off the back of that and then thought, well, I've really got to learn how to do this. <laughs> Best buy some speakers now. <laughs> Right. And, um, so you know, it's um, it's been a long journey. Uh, I'm completely self-taught, but it's been fun. You know, I've enjoyed it. Well, that's cool. I think that was good advice. I mean, there's the classic story of how people at Abbey Road would start in the, you know, in the cutting room for for lacquers and vinyl, to kind of learn what you can do and what things should sound like and what you can get away with, and then they would work their way backwards into the engineering and producing role so i think that was probably good advice um so that's very interesting so did you not enjoy mixing or just wasn't wasn't clicking for you is that it just that didn't I... happen but i've kind of come to realize that i've got quite a short attention span and sitting with one song for a day and I, I don't operate well um right. Whereas doing an album in a day, I love that. I love, I really like mastering because you're finishing something. Whereas yeah. mixing to me felt really chaotic because you're, you know, you're in the middle of a project and it could go any direction and that feels really stressful. Whereas mastering is kind of like, I will finish this and get it so that I oh, is super happy with it. That feels nice. Right. People used to ask me if I would get tired of hearing the same song. When I was mixing, I didn't too much because the song was evolving and changing, but I definitely appreciate mastering these days where I'm done with an album in a day and it's a very quick process. And as I get older, you know, I could do long days, but as I get older, it's like, it's nice to take ear breaks whenever you need to and not, not do those long days because your body starts to change and you need to rest a little more than when you were in your you know, teens and twenties. So, um, so I know you did some tape transfer work. Do you want to talk about any of that? Did that, did that help with any mastering skills or, um, anything that's helping you out today? Um, I don't know if it directly helped, but it was really fascinating. So I started working on a project called unlocking our sound heritage for the British library. And, the goal was to digitize loads and loads of um, formats, recordings, um, and then to make them accessible to either the general public on the internet or at the British Library on the, in their reading rooms, depending on like different permissions. Um, and that that was incredible. I love history so much, and to get to listen to you know recordings which haven't been listened to since they were made was just amazing so that was very really cool um i will say it taught me a lot of patience because uh <laughs> you know some tapes there'd be kind of 200 odd splices which needed repairing per tape um there was a lot of dealing with moldy tapes which is not so glamorous um right. but you know really really fun and we were transferring four tapes at a time. So kind of, yeah, practicing juggling things. Wow, uh, so, f so you'd have four different setups going, you just keep an eye on them all, like juggling a little yeah. bit. Put in, <laughs> making sure none of them were, no tapes have snapped or jammed or getting eaten. Yeah, that's it. So that was, um, yeah, that was very, uh, Kind of, you had to be really, really patient, but also on the ball all the time. Like, you could guarantee that as soon as you, you know, went to get a glass of water or something, something would break. Oh yeah, yep. Uh, <laughs> I feel that. 
that's but how it was things a fun work. Job. It was a really fun job. Um, I do miss that. And, you know, it was amazing to to hear such varied material and to work on tape every day. Like, it's so physical. It's really, really nice. Yeah, we got to, you know, attention to detail and, you know, be very careful. There's no, really no undos with tape sometimes. Uh, you, sometimes you get one chance to get it right. Um, what are some some challenges that you experience with mastering these days? Is there anything like recurring themes that, that you um, experience with mixes without getting too negative about anything? You know, are there some things that mix engineers that might be watching this either live or in the future, you know, some things you know, to be aware of when sending in stuff for mastering, things to listen for, things not to do? Um, I don't think so. I've been really, really lucky to work with some just amazing people, producers, artists, mix engineers, and um, I think that, you know, 99% of the stuff that I get sent is is amazing. It's the odd occasion where, you know, um, sometimes there'll be a little click or sometimes... You know, just the the end of the the fade out is cut off slightly, but it's really not um, not common at all. But you know, that's what I'm there for is to yep. to spot yeah. things like that. Um, but yeah, I've been really really lucky in that just, I work with some amazing people, and you know, everything's different and it's got its own personality. But I like that. That's great. Um, yeah, no, nothing to. I guess the sort of, I guess the one thing which I do tend to ask for quite a lot is for the instrumentals to be sent at the same time as the main masters, just because it speeds up the process a little bit. But it's not the end of the world if, you know, the mix engineer hasn't had time to print the instrumentals. Yeah. Yet. So sometimes do... they just need the main versions mastering ASAP and then the instrumentals are a bit of an afterthought. But... Yeah, it's funny you say that. Right before we did this, I got a email from a client you know he was approving a project i just sent but then he's like can you make an instrumental from the thing we did earlier this year and i think he's expecting me to be able to take the vocals out rather than you know send me a proper instrumental to master so yeah those are things you know logistical things i on my website i try to just get put those questions out there ahead of time so people think oh yeah we should we should do the instrumental now because especially if the person is using analog gear it's just so much easier and faster to to do it at the same time versus get back in that headspace and find your settings and or file management. So yeah, those that, that was a good answer. Um, are you? This has kind of been an increasing problem that I've kind of seen. But are are mix engineers sending you kind of like their loud limited version and then sending you a non limited to to work from and try to match or exceed what they do? Or are you just get it, Are you just mastering what they give you and and sometimes it's really limited and you don't need to do much or how, how has that f experience been for you? Um, I think about 50% of the time I get sent a, a reference mix and that's always useful to know what the artist has been listening to. Um, I did have a case where um, the, one time the mix that the artist had been sent was completely different to the mix that I had been sent. And the artist kept on asking for the master to be more like the mix. So I said, okay, can you send me the mix? The mix that they had was nothing like the mix that I had. Um, so I said, okay, can I have like a proper copy of this, not an MP3? Yeah. And the producer was like, oh, well, that's just the listening copy. I ran it through Lambda. And obviously, AI processing, I don't know what the fuck could happen, but like it, yeah, it was so different <laughs> to the mix. Um, and you know, the artist had never actually heard the final mix, which was bonkers. Oh, yeah, um, I've, had, I've had that happen where you're starting from something that is completely different than what anyone's been listening to. So, yeah, I was just curious, curious if it's just me or if it's happening to others and how you kind of address that. I mean, obviously for me, that's just been one time. Okay, well, that's good. That for me was an instant. No, please don't do this. Like, yeah. I don't know. I get that everyone's learning, and you know, there's no standards, and that's what makes the music industry really beautiful. 
you know, we're all making art here and that's great. And I love that everyone's free to experiment, but I feel like people do need to be on the same page. And so if you have a mix, make sure everyone has approved the mix, not just the version that's been, you know, run through everything that you can possibly run it through. <laughs> Yeah, because there's definitely been some cases where once you start removing stuff, it changes quite a bit, and it can help the mastering person quite a bit just to hear what people have been used to hearing. Um, we talked; you already mentioned some of the things you like about mastering, such as you know you can do a whole album in a single day, and it's fast paced and good for you know shorter attention spans. Is there anything else you know, that comes to mind that you really enjoy about the mastering process specifically? Um. Finishing things, I really get a lot of satisfaction from like, finishing and handing off final masters. Um, I think helping artists release their music as well, because it can be a bit of a, I don't know, I, I started out as a musician. It's really scary and there's loads of confusing things and, to, you know, make that process easier for people um, and kind of answer any questions if they have any. Like, I really like that part of it. That's really rewarding. Um and then also the <laughs> this is gonna sound really lame, but the music nerd in me really likes to hear things like just new music every day. And so being able to hear an album a day is just yeah, it doesn't feel like a real job. That's crazy to me. You know, just fifteen year old me would not believe that I'm doing this right now. Right. Um it's just amazing, like getting to hear that much new music from artists all over the world. It's just incredible. Yeah. Sometimes people ask me, you know, what new music have you been listening to? And I can't really think of anything that, cause I'm always listening to new music during the day. So I really don't get much casual music listening time and I'm not just going to mention stuff I've worked on. So I don't, that's the only kind of downside to mastering I found is you don't often get time to explore new music outside of what you're working on, but you know, there things could be worse. There, there is a question that kind of fits into what we're, what we're talking about. Um, I'll just try to read it. It says, as you mentor younger and newer engineers at Weird Jungle or elsewhere, what are common suggestions you have for them, you know, as they try to understand how to do mastering as well as how to just operate, a, you know, a business that, you know, gets people's music in and out the door in a, in a correct way? Um, I think mastering-wise is just really practice critical listening um like really really practice you know listen to the way a mix sounds listen to how everything in a mix interacts together listen to what changes when you put a limiter on something um you know just really take your time and don't overdo it and i would say as well like there seems to be a lot of um I don't know, pressure for people to sort of, I don't know, I guess be a full-time mastering engineer really quickly. Um, whereas it, it took me seven years of working jobs and then mastering evenings and weekends. And I kind of think the slower process was good because it meant I, you know, I had a day job. I didn't burn out. Mastering was like the treat <laughs> afterwards. Right. Um, right. And it meant that, you know, because I had a steady day job, I didn't have to sort of, you know, worry too much about, you know, paying rent or whatever, because the day job took care of that. And then I, I could just focus on learning, you know, and I still practice mastering. Every week I just pick a different thing and practice it on all the songs that I've already, you know, worked on before like years and years ago um so i'd definitely say like take it slow just enjoy enjoy it um and don't kind of yeah don't rush into anything because you probably burn out and, and start hating it well, i think i would have anyway like i don't really operate very well you know just trying to pick something up really fast um yeah. and then i think business wise um, I think just be really, really patient with people and be honest with people as well. Like if it's something you're not sure about, then ask. Um, 
I think if you can have really good communication with the people that you're working with, it's going to make everything a lot easier and a lot nicer for everyone involved. Um, and so, you know, if you're like, I don't know, here's an example. So I was asked to master a song, the mix engineer sent me an amazing reference master. And I was like, hey, dude, I can't get my master to sound as good as your ref. What limit are you using? And he was like, oh, this is what I'm using. Here are my settings. This will be a great starting point for you. And I was like, oh my God, thank you so much. Used his settings, tweaked them slightly, sent it back to him. And he was like, cool, you took my ref master and made it even better. Like, this is great. So that kind of just really open communication and admitting when you don't know how to do something, I think is really like great for learning but also you know building relationships and just yeah it's better than sitting and stressing about it yeah i agree i mean communication is key i mean sometimes you read on forums that people had a bad mastering experience because they sent it off to get mastered they didn't like it the mastering engineer wouldn't do revisions or respond and took their money and i, I think that's just a bad way to operate I, I honestly don't know any mastering engineers that do operate that way so i'm not sure who these mythical bad mastering engineers are, that, but I don't think you should be afraid of it. And I also think you're definitely right about taking it slow. I, I also see in some of the forums, you know, people trying to get into mastering and it's, it's, it's a really slow build to get a client base that's going to, you know, trust you to do mastering and, uh, and keep coming back to you. So I, I think taking it super slow is a great way to learn and then make sure you like it and make sure things are stable and then eventually you'll be full time. Um, if you just keep doing your best work and treating people uh, how you want to be treated, which is pretty basic advice. But um, let me see here. There was a question. Um, we can kind of transition into some Wave Lab type stuff. Um, before I ask a, a question from the group, was there something about Wave Lab that appealed to you, or how did you discover Wave Lab and have it become, you know, the main software that you use for mastering? Because um, it's, it's becoming a lot more common, I think in the last, ever since it came to Mac, but you know, it's not, it's definitely not the most common, you know, people think Pro Tools, Logic, Cubase, but you know, WaveLab is specialized for mastering. Um, so I was just kind of curious how you discovered it. So, um, probably show my age a bit here, but I, um, I got a copy of Cubasis in 2003. And I got a um, a free copy of Wave Lab Lite on a CD when the logo yeah. was. Um, anyway, I tried it because I don't know everything's really exciting. Then, <laughs> and, uh, yeah, found it was like way more exciting than uh, than Cubasis, and I really liked it. And I just mess around with it at home, not for mastering, just for like you know, processing audio um, and making weird sounds and stuff. And yeah, I guess, I think I got sort of a, a proper wave lab kind of, so I was using Cubase until about 2011 and then I got a proper, proper wave lab then. Um, just because I remember that I'd had this demo or this, you know, wave lab light version and that I really enjoyed it. So I was like, oh, I'll pick up a pick up a real real copy of that. And uh yeah, just really enjoyed it. It kind of does everything everything you'd need um yeah. in one place. So, you know, why not? Right. So when you came back to Wave Lab, was that after it had come over to Mac or were you still on a PC then? I was still on a PC then. I was still on okay. a PC until like two thousand and fifteen. Okay. I'm a late a late adopter of Mac. <laughs> oh, that's that's fair. I was just curious because for me, the fact that it came to Mac was um, a big selling point and perfect timing because I was outgrowing Wave Burner, which came with Logic. So I was like, "What do I, I need? Something better." And Wave Lab had just come over to Mac, so the timing was perfect. You know, are there some specific things that you remember? You know, it being excelling at. You know, like. Do you use clip effects and things like that, or is it just kind of the overall package that you enjoyed about it compared to other things? Yeah, I definitely use the clip effects 
sort of when I was starting and just like making samples and stuff. Um, but I really like tabs. Like I find my brain works really well in that order. Yeah, um, you mul multiple tabs. files open at a, at the same time. Yeah, yeah, and you know, like a traditional door is kind of, I guess, like lin linear. I, d I don't know. It just makes sense for me just to see one thing at a time rather than having, you know, loads of audio files in the same same session. Um, yeah, that's kind of my favorite favorite thing about WaveLab. I mean, I probably work in a really on. Um, I don't know. I know that you've done loads of like wave lab workflows thing, and I probably work in a really unorthodox way in comparison. Probably really slow and clunky, but it kind of makes sense in my head. Um, so, yeah, that's like my favorite favorite thing. Gotcha. Well, that's kind of the thing with wave lab. There's so many ways to do the same thing. I mean, I I, I just made up my own way of doing it too. There's really no right way. Um, but there's like a number of ways to do kind of the same thing. So it's been interesting to see how everybody, you know, gets to the same end result, but using different methods. And one of the questions we have is, um, kind of about your, your, your setup in wave lab. Um, he's asking if you use a hybrid approach, which for those that may not be familiar would be, you know, using a combination of plugins and analog hardware. Uh, to do the mastering work. So I guess the question would be, do you have kind of a hybrid setup? It looks like I see some analog pieces back there. There it is. And then um, if you want to just tell us about it, kind of how you like to approach things and kind of nerd out a little bit. I think there's people that want, I try not to do too much gear talk on these, but I think there's some people that might not mind a little bit of gear, gear talk if you're willing to, to talk sure. through some of your process <laughs> and what you like to use. Um, so I, again, probably really unorthodox way of working, do an analog pass and then a digital pass. Um, and, but when I do a digital pass, I see whether the analog is actually like me or not. That... Sometimes I don't use it. Um, but when I do the analog pass, I'm more concentrating on tone. I get a lot of things that are all mixed in the box and sometimes just need a little bit of gel, gluing, um, vibe, saturation, that kind of thing. Um, so I have this tube EQ, which is really, really nice. Um, okay. I have a, an AMEC EQ down there, just on the, my tape machine, which is just okay. that shot. And then, um, We've got a, a Neve EQ and then the SSL Fusion there, um, which I only really use for the space knob. I like the space okay. knob on the SSL Fusion. Interesting. I haven't tried that can yet. Can sometimes but I've... be magic. Not all the time, but can sometimes. But I only really use it for that. Um, mainly on acoustic music, not not really anything else. But um, so yeah, I kind of try and see what. Um, flavor the music needs um do an analog pass and then kind of process in the box as you kind of i don't know i guess as people have probably seen a million times on the internet yeah. um i i really like keeping things really really simple and not doing too much um you know my well i start every song as if it's its own thing because it is its own thing i don't have a go-to mastering chain um i really like to keep an open mind and just focus on what the music needs as opposed to what i want to use you know sometimes you're like oh i've just got this new new thing new plugin or whatever i really want to use it um but i find that approach always you know never ends well right. um so i find it really important to if i get anything new just use it in practice for a few weeks and you know when I'm mastering, just focus on what the music needs. How do I how do I get it to match the artist's vision for this? Um, and you know, generally, everything I work on is just incredible, great mixes. And you know, music doesn't always need loads of this stuff. Like I, one of the things that I've really learned over the past 
two or three years is just to not go overboard. And as soon as I stopped going overboard and really, you know, if I'm going to do something, I have to say a reason why I'm going to do it. Otherwise, it just shouldn't be done. And a lot sense. of people have been a lot happier with their masters since they've been doing that. It's like when RuPaul says you, ha- you leave the house, you have to take one thing off before you go on the catwalk or whatever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, like, you know, mm-hmm. rein yourself in a bit. I know it can be really exciting with, like, gear and processing and stuff, but, um, you know, when people send you mixes, generally they're really, really happy with them. Um, and so it's not really our jobs to change things for the sake of it. That, that's how I treat it. Whether it's someone that's mixing their first album or someone that's been doing it for decades, I, I just assume that they're super happy with it or they wouldn't have sent it in yet. You know, I try to do as little as possible. You know, it's it's it can be hard to resist the urge to use new things or I think people starting out and mastering come at it more heavy handed than you need to be. And for me, I've noticed, you know, I'm, I'm getting better clients. So the mixes are coming in better. I'm, I'm hopefully getting better at my craft and, you know, getting better monitoring, which we can kind of segue into the speakers you're using. But I found also, you know, the more my monitoring improves in the room and everything, you're like, actually, this doesn't need as much as I thought. Cause I'm not battling, you know, the speakers and the room and, and things like that. So that's been my experience. Um, someone had asked about your monitoring, and I can see that you have a PMC speaker up there. If you want to give us a rundown of that or just kind of mention what you're using and, you know, why you might have picked them and, and anything about them. So, um, yeah, I have my PMCs here. Yeah. Okay, yep. Pointing in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, they're the PMC 226s. And so I was at one of these, like, trade show kind of things and the guy from pmc was like oh do you want to listen to some speakers and i was like sure why not anyway heard these guys i'm a load of other speakers but i heard these guys and i was like i i'm a fan of these fucking love them um yeah took me four years to save up for them but um just really really love them and then I also have that's my cup of tea. Um, these I don't know if they're in shot, which are the Bowser Milk and 702s, um, which are a hi fi speaker, um, but they are really nice for quality check in um, or just to sit on the sofa and listen to <laughs> some music on. Yeah, um, that's important really too. Funny. Yeah. Um, let's see, we did have a question. Um, earlier back about we kind of getting into this topic, but do you use anything for stereo widening? I mean, I personally don't do any widening unless someone asked me to after they hear the master or if their reference version had some on for better or worse, or sometimes there's like an oddball song on an album that sounds kind of narrow compared to the rest of the mixes. And I might use it on that one song. Do, do you have a widener that you like to use uh, when, when you do use one? I don't know. I think the space knob. So the Fusion has a space knob and a width knob. Gotcha. I'm scared of the width knob, but the space knob kind of, it feels like it gives, if you've got a particularly dry mix or something that feels a little bit narrow, it seems to give things just a little bit of a, a place, which is quite nice. Um, so I really like that. I think... I don't have a widener, like in the box or anything, but um, I quite like using a mid-side EQ and just if there's sort of if things are sounding a little bit too narrow, um, just having a look at the sides and see if there's any sort of, you know, low mids in there which are particularly muddy and just notching them down like a dB or so, it can really like make things feel wider without actually, you know, being wider. I don't know. <laughs> That seems yeah. like a rubbish answer, but no, absolutely, I, I agree with that. You know, the, just cleaning up some stuff in the mids can just make things feel wider. Um, I haven't played with the the fusion, but now you've, you've got me a little bit interested. I'm gonna well, let's let's continue on this topic. Do you have any favorite plugins in general? They don't have to be Steinberg plugins, but any kind of plugins with, unless you don't want to give away any secrets. But are there some that you find yourself using on every? 
most sessions, you know, whether it's a little bit or a lot or, you know, um, I know every session is different, but any, if you could pick, you know, a handful of plugins to bring with you um, in a mobile setup, you know, what, what might those be? Um, so I really like the Mc DSP multiband compressor, limiter, expander, gate, the thing that does everything. Yeah. It's been like really, really like that. Um, really like the DMG Limitless limiter. I feel like the Fab Filter limiter has a place in my heart. Like, so, you know, sometimes there's just nothing, nothing beats it, especially for like, you know, if you're doing a punk album, it just sounds really right. Um, I like the Sonic from Q as well. I would agree that the Fab Filter limiter could be really simple and basic, but it doesn't sound as, you know, kind of harsh as like the Waves L2, you know, which was a classic. So, you know, the DMG limiter is great. It, it's got, it can be, it can do a lot of damage. Well, it has a lot of options. So, you know, you got to, I think it takes a little while to study it and figure out everything that it's doing um, or can do and what how you want to use it but it is a cool tool once it that's the one that took me a while to work it into my setup uh, but once i understood it I, it gets used sometimes for sure um i've got a few more questions for you but if i didn't get to any questions in the chat if you want to re-ask it because i'm kind of multitasking here it's a little bit hard to scroll all the way back in the chat so if i missed any questions feel free to re-ask them i'm not trying to ignore them here and if I'm looking over here, I'm looking at the questions. I'm not checking my Facebook and my emails and stuff. <laughs> Same with my, my phone. Um, I'm an amateur live streamer here, but I'm doing my best. But oh, feel... I thought you would have been looking at Chester. No, he gets he gets a little. He doesn't like to be down here when I'm doing these because he just doesn't like the talking. I guess he's a good studio dog. He he doesn't care about music. He used to be. He used to spend more time in here, and you know he wouldn't be phased by music one bit. But I don't know if he's getting older or what, but he just doesn't come in the studio as often. So he's he's in the other room, and especially since I'm like he doesn't like when I'm on the phone either um, oh. for some reason. Especially when I'm on, you know, like AirPods, and it sounds like I'm just talking to myself or something. So anyway, no Chester in here, but maybe he'll maybe he just heard his name and he'll come down. <laughs> but um, so if anyone has any questions, you know, we can transition into the general. Q and A. I had a couple more. You know, we touched on this a little bit, and I wanted to mention when you were talking about, you know, kind of your presets and things, and doing as little as possible. To me, that's kind of where the and and that lander mix that you were sent. Um, to me, that's kind of what where the AI stuff gets it wrong because it's always trying to do stuff. You know, it's like looking at your mix and saying, "I need to do something." And kind of the true test to that is like if you sent a song through it and then sent it back through again, it's going to try to do more stuff. Whereas if you mastered a song um, and then someone sent it back to you, you know, ideally you would say, you know, this is, I wouldn't do anything to it. Or like when you got the really good reference mix from an engineer, you know, like, it's the, you're like I, I shouldn't do anything to this. So have you, I know you probably have opinions about the AI mastering, but have you found it affecting your business in a negative or positive way? Or is it just kind of a whole different thing that's not even on your radar yeah it's i feel very different about it like it's it's just the whole thing that's not my radar i mean it's not mastering because it's not going to tell you if there's talking on the end of a vocal take it's not going to tell you yeah. if you've sent an mp3 by accident it's it's not going to do any of that it's not going to make your formats for you it's not going to make a ddp or your vinyl side that's not really mastering um it's just audio processing and you know i think it has its place like i think if you're um you know maybe you're a band and you're recording in your garage some demos to send to a producer and you just want to like make them a bit louder then sure whatever um but it, you know it's not it's not mastering um i don't think it's really affected like my business or anything um but yeah i don't really know because you know it was it's weird when kind of companies have that much of a 
marketing budget and a push and stuff behind them for this thing which they're saying is the job that you're doing but isn't really the job that you're doing but you're still getting loads of work that you love anyway so it's kind of like I don't really know how to feel about it um yeah. I don't know what do you reckon well I, I definitely agree with you I mean I agree that they're calling it mastering but really it's stereo processing you know if I always say if I just stereo processed the files I was sent and didn't have speakers and just looked at the meters and analyzers and sent it back, you know, I wouldn't really have any return clients probably. Um, and it's not about, you know, some people are like, well, you're just afraid that the computer is better than you. And it's nothing like that. It's just that the stereo processing is just a part of what I do every day as a mastering engineer and, and you as well. You know, like you said, it's quality control, you know, listening for, you know, noises that they didn't intend to be in there, whether it's in the middle of the song or at the end, you know, as the song's fading out, you know, sequencing the songs, you know, there's so much more to mastering. And I think it's unfortunate that some certain companies have rebranded mastering as just the stereo processing. It's a little, it, it kind of, it's unfortunate because people that don't know any better use it and think their project is mastered. But I, you know, I've, I've gotten a number of inquiries like, I used Lander, but my CD manufacturer needs this format, or I'm doing vinyl, and they need this, and it's like, well, yeah, that's <laughs> that's, that, that's part of the mastering process. So that's what you thought you were getting, but you couldn't get. And you know, and kind of like what I said earlier, an AI thing is just going to keep reprocessing a song until it's mangled. Whereas, you know, if 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 I get something in that sounds great, whether it's the ref, the mix engineer dialed it in or not that that's ever happened, but someone sends me my master back, I'd be like, this doesn't really need any sonic changes, but there's formatting and details to take care of. Um, so I was just curious about that. I had that on my list of questions and wanted to use it to transition, but someone's asking both of us what we think about the native plugins in WaveLab. And I guess I'll go first and say that um, I'm a bit of a creature of habit too, kind of like Katie said, she uses an older version of WaveLab. I just, I'm a creature of habit in that I, I don't really like to experiment too much. And when I started using WaveLab, the the plugins that it came with were, I didn't feel like they were um, on the same page as some of the third party stuff. And I just wasn't familiar with their controls and I didn't want to slow down and relearn something I already knew how to do and something else. So I used a lot of third party plugins, but I will say when I used to teach a mastering class at the technical college, I had to rely on all native plugins because that's all the school had. You know, schools can't really buy 20 copies of all the third-party plugins. So long story short, I was really impressed with, you know, the master rig plugin that WaveLab now comes with. I guess it's been for a while. To me, it's still kind of new because, again, I'm just usually so in the zone that I just don't, I don't really experiment with plugins, you know, for fun, you know, so I've just, you know, maybe someday I should do that. But, um, I like a lot of the utility stuff, like the, just the general gain, um, you know, some of the, I, I tend to use the, the utility stuff and the metering in wave lab is really one of its strengths. So I, I don't know if, and I don't want to put you on the spot, but if you use any of the built-in plugins of wave lab, someone was asking, but that's kind of my opinion on it. Um, when I worked for the British Library, we would use the, you know, the built-in metering all the time, and I still do now. Um, so, for example, every tape that we transferred, we had to adjust the azimuth on to recreate the position of the tape heads when the tape was recorded to get as much information off the tape as possible. Um, so we used the phase scope a lot for that, um, and also used the kind of frequency analyzers and stuff, and that was amazing. Still check the phase on stuff I'm working on on phase scope. Find that really useful. But you know, similar to Justin, like a lot of the plugins I use, I have been using for quite a few years, and um, yeah, I don't know. It's very rare that I get a new a new plugin <laughs> or want to learn. You know, want to learn a new plugin. I really like kind of challenging myself to use what I've got in different ways. Cause I think, um, I think I've seen too many people who have too many plugins. Right. And are kind of like paralyzed by choice maybe a little bit. 
um you know and i kind of yeah i guess that scares me a bit and i i quite like to know my tools really really well so that's why i've not but yeah the use of the ones are great um yeah same here i lied before i have actually used the built-in the native widener for a song that got sent as a mono file and they couldn't go back to the mix and they wanted it to not be mono or not right. sound quite as narrow so i used the stereo widener on that but it was um yeah it, sound, it came out sounding cool um but i would i don't know widener scare me a little bit <laughs> yeah they can easily cause damages they could be kind of um intriguing at first and then you realize that there's other problems you know for me you know if i had to use a, and in fact there's been times where i'm tempted to challenge myself you know if i had to use all the built only built-in plugins of wave lab to master something i wouldn't be bummed out or scared it would just take me a little longer to familiarize myself with them and get in a groove but like when i'm in a busy day i'm just i'm kind of playing my studio like instrument you know i have a stream deck and presets and i'm just not even thinking so for me to like open a new plugin it's kind of like throwing a wrench in my process that i just again i've been using wave labs so long you know if i i just haven't really had time to explore these um you know some of the newer stuff that they've been adding you know you know wave, i think it was wave lab 11 got some nice updated native plugins and master rig came with version 10 i think i don't know i just it's for me it's just a time thing uh, but it, it does and the other thing too is you know i think people think is you know, when you buy a math and part of this is because of the plugin companies that you, when you buy a mastering software, people think they're buying something for the stereo processing, but really wave lab, wave lab strength is kind of the vehicle that it provides for getting people's mixes, doing what you need to do and then exporting it in any format you might need, whether it's vinyl, CD, wave files, MP3. And, you know, if you set it up right, you know, you're entering the titles and metadata one time and, whatever you render everything comes out with the files tagged and named correctly and you're not you're not having to like rename everything for every format so that's kind of where wave lab excels you know and you know the metering is the, you know i was using pro tools a lot before i used wave lab and once i got wave lab i'm like wow i feel like i just got a great pair of glasses because the, the metering in pretty much any mixing daw is pretty horrible actually it, it's good for letting you know if something's has signal or if it's clipping or really low, but it's really not detailed at all. And maybe it's gotten a little better since I was mixing more, but you know, when you think of, when I think of pro tools metering, it's just like this tiny little thing and you just want to make the red light not come on. Um, a couple other questions before we wrap it up here. Um, I guess this one's for both of us. If you want to go first though, what suggestion would you both have for mixing engineers when delivering mixes for mastering and what makes a master ready mix? That's a really good question. Um, I really like to receive mixes um, with just a little bit of room at the start and the end, just to make sure that everything is there. Um, I like to receive mixes that are clearly labeled. You know, that's always yes. nice. If, you know, if they've got the artist name, the song name, and the mix version in the file name, that's always really nice. Um, yeah, don't just call your folder final mixes because mastering engineers have a lot of final mixes. It really helps put that. Yeah. <laughs> think, think bigger picture. Put give us a little more information, you know, artist name, album, anything other than final mixes would be awesome. Because when uh, you download a week's work in your downloads folder, it's like, I don't know, seven different files all called final mix. And you're like, yeah, who? <laughs> yeah um, I mean, in, in the pre COVID days, I had an assistant that would help prep sessions for me. And he would kind of weed out those situations where, you know, I get the project info, I get the 10 song album, but one when it's one song it's easy to figure out but if you get two or three songs that are named nothing like the official title it's hard to do that detective work then they're listening to lyrics to see does do, the, do they say that does the chorus have the proper title because it was just a working title or something so um yeah labeling is really helpful i would agree with that for sure 
Yeah, I think um, a ref mix is nice if the band have been listening, you know, definitely send what the band have been listening to for sure if it's different to the mix that is ready for mastering. Um, have a have a little separate folder in there for instrumentals. That's nice. Sometimes when everything is all in one folder, especially for an album, and, you know, maybe you've got 12 songs on an album, then 12 instrumentals, 12 TV, TV mixes, to have them all lumped in the same folder can be quite a lot. So putting any instrumentals and alternative mixes in a, just a separate folder inside the main folder is nice, just so it's not super overwhelming. Although that's not a deal breaker. Yeah, I same here. Files, but you know, that's a nice touch. Yeah, I'm used to. I'm I'm used to experiencing you know messes, but and I don't require it, but I like you know if people know the song order, it's great if they number the files, you know, you know, put zero one and the file name. I know that's not always possible, but if I got two albums to do and one one project is nicely organized and the other one's a mess, I'm probably gonna just do the organized one first because it's less taxing on my brain. Um, and that's where it was nice to have an assistant to set up projects because then it. I didn't have to think about that stuff. No, uh, but between between moving and COVID, I'm doing everything myself again, which is fine. Um, was that? A, do you have anything else to add? I had a couple thoughts before we move on um, about uh, mixes. I don't know actually. I guess just making sure that um, you know when you when you save your mix, like pull the file back into Pro Tools and have a look at it and just check that. It's not square, it's not clipping. Like a little bit of a quality check is always a good thing. Um, yeah, that's always nice. Sometimes you get people who say, I've heard I need, you know, minus six dB of headroom or whatever, but then their, their waveform is just a square because it's being absolutely slammed into a limiter. And it's like, well, okay, that's nice, but dynamics are nice too. Yeah, the headroom thing, that's kind of a weird term. I mean, I th I think it, it meant well, but I mean, I think what people mean is the dynamics. And, you know, that's that's such a... I, I wrote an article about this, about how that's kind of a myth. I mean, I think it came from, like, the DAT recorder days where you didn't want to clip the DAT machine and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, for me, it's like, you know, just listen to the files. It gets messy when producers are sending the files for the artist because, you know, I've had cases where I master the song and the client's like, I love it, but where are the backing vocals? And it's like, oh, when the person made the bounce for mastering, the backing vocals are muted. And I would never know that the song was supposed to have backing vocals. So, I mean, just obvious stuff like that really can save a lot of time because there really is no pop it in and use the same settings um, in mastering. Everything takes time to redo, and then we're quality controlling our work, so that's a real-time process. Um, I think we're getting near the end here. Um, there was a question... A little ways back um, see if I can find it I don't think I can find it um, if there are any follow-up questions I think most people watching are aware of the wave lab users group on Facebook where you can ask questions and I'm in there and Katie's a member so if there's any follow-ups you know feel free to um, ask any questions in there and we can address them but um, is there anything else you want to add? Any other cool projects that are things or events? Or do we cover everything? Uh, I think we covered everything pretty much. But um, pre-order pre the ARCS album, Ride or Die, which is out next year. Because right, honestly, it is just, it's very special to me because they're just incredible humans. Gotcha. And that's ARXX, right? Yeah. Yeah, so follow them on Instagram or wherever and then check it out as they start to prepare the launch of it because it sounds like Katie's pretty excited about that. Well, I know it's getting late there, um, and we really appreciate your time and answering all these questions and everything else that you do. And, you know, we didn't even get to talk about some of the other stuff that you're involved with, but um, is there a place where people could follow you um, to follow some of the other stuff you're involved with? Yeah, so I'm Katie Tabini on, like, Instagram and um, Twitter, and that's my website, katerabini.co.uk. And Weird Jungle is uh, weird underscore jungle. 
um, on Instagram and weirdjungle.com on the interwebs. And then I have a group called 2% Rising, which I run with my wonderful friend Jenny, um, which is a Facebook group for women, non-binary and trans engineers and producers, which if you just search 2% Rising in Facebook, and they're also on Instagram. Um, I think that's it. I think that's okay. everything. Okay, great. Well, yeah, definitely check out those things if you're interested. But, you know, you're doing a lot of great stuff, so we appreciate your time tonight. Thank and, you so much for having me. It's great to chat. Of course. Well, I'm going to sign off. And, if, any, like I said, any follow-up questions, just find us on the Facebook group. Or sometimes I find time to respond to the comments in these videos, but I don't really get notified, so I just check every few weeks. But, anyways, thanks again for everybody watching and for Katie for doing this. And we'll, I will see you guys next month with another Wave Lab live stream.